Welcome to this amazing uh, town hall discussion uh, on basic income. I'm so lucky to have uh, so many great supporters, some other uh, wonderful folks on the call. Um, I'm really happy to be joined by Rochelle Devereaux, who's the Ontario Liberal Party candidate for Guelph. Um, hi, Rochelle, welcome. Thank you, and hi to so many familiar faces from Guelph and, and area, uh, and then also lots of people that I recognize from across the province too, from a, a long amount of work in health, uh, healthcare, especially health that's impacted by poverty. So uh, really yeah. excited to talk about this really important uh, issue tonight. Yeah, that's great. Um, so before we start, I just want to say uh, that many of us are joining from the traditional territory of the Mississauga and Anishinaabe. Um, Rochelle, I know that you're joining from the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, and I'm actually currently on the traditional territories of the Lenape people. Um, and I just want to make sure that we continue to honor the teachings and the care of the land of Indigenous peoples for time immemorial, and that we're always uh, committing to walking the long road of reconciliation together. And on this note, something that I also want to mention that's really important to me is that um, there's a lot of inequality and discrimination that's built into our society that's a result of colonialism and uh, previous attitudes. And so as we talk about how to resolve inequalities and build um, policies that are going to help everyone, we really need to, to keep that in mind as we do that. So that's going to be really important for me. Um, so uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. It promises to be an excellent, excellent discussion. Um, so for those who don't know um, Rochelle, uh, the amazing candidate for Guelph. Um, so uh, Rochelle is the CEO of the regional health team in, uh, in Guelph. She's a community leader and somebody that I have felt lucky enough to call my friend through this process. Um, I hope that I'm not stepping on some boundaries there, Rochelle, but I really do think you're a good friend of mine now. Um, and I'm just so lucky that you're here. And I know, Rochelle, you've also brought a special guest um, with you. Would you like to introduce Floyd? I sure would, but I have to admit, I just realized I didn't bring Floyd's bio uh, with me. So Floyd, you have to say some of the things. Floyd uh, is a good friend of mine, uh, who I actually had the incredible uh, luck and privilege to meet this summer. And so when some of us are spending time together over the course of the next hopefully many years uh, together, uh, do ask me when we run into each other about how I met Floyd. But it's really, uh, it, was, uh, it was what I feel like was a really lucky and miraculous moment to have this uh, this fellow uh, live in my backyard. And uh, Floyd is someone who has a long history uh, of leading, and he can say better than I, uh, in the tech industry. Um, I think I said maybe, Floyd, that you like wrote a magazine for Java, and you looked at me and were like, no, no, it's not like that. So you can maybe say it better than me. Uh, but Floyd then uh, started a not-for-profit uh, a, a few years ago uh, called Basic Income, uh, UBI Works, Universal Basic Income Works, uh, and has started on a, a different career path, uh, uh, still very involved uh, in the tech side of things, uh, but uh, now committed to building a, a movement and to not just building a movement, but implementing a movement uh, around basic income. And so, uh, Floyd, I'm pretty lucky to call you my friend. And I know that uh, you have another commitment this evening, uh, but we feel pretty darn lucky to have you on the call tonight. So uh, if you would not mind, uh, I'd like you to start off this town hall with a question that I have for you, uh, which is, why basic income, Floyd? Why does it matter? And, and why did you choose uh, this this very specific issue uh, based on your, your own life experience. Thank you. Very kind introduction. Um, it's my honor to be here with, with all of you. Came here for this important topic. And I'm really wishing Rochelle and Greg uh, uh, best of luck. I uh, hope we get elected. Um, the, the former Liberal Party obviously was a, a world leader in the basic income. The, the Ontario pilot was the most um, important pilot of its time. And even now, with all the pilots that are running the world today, it, it, that pilot was still the most important pilot in its design and, and uh, what it would have achieved. So I was um, uh, transitioning out of um, 
a, a software developer education company that I'd run for 15 years and Doug Ford canceled the pilot and I got really mad and I thought, well, what can I do about it? <laughs> and uh, so I decided to uh, start this nonprofit that promotes basic income and we've uh, uh, we're the largest sort of movement that can mobilize Canadians. You know, we can get tens of thousands to sign petitions, email their MPs. Um, uh, you can follow uh, UBI Works on Facebook or on, on Twitter. We're big following and trying to give Canadians um, things to do every week. There's always digital activism we're giving Canadians to do. We have 60,000 emails on our list to just keep, keep the noise up, keep the pressure up. And uh, so why is basic income important now? Well, it was always important. I mean, poverty was always important, and it almost passed in the U.S. Congress in 1968. And uh, and it, imagine if it had, uh, we would have had a very different world today. And even in um, in the 80s, I think something called the Carter Commission uh, recommended to the Canadian government that um, if you're going to do free trade, you also have to do basic income, because people who are displaced by globalization uh, need to have some means of picking up their lives and and uh, being able to invest and retrain and do other things. Uh, now we know what happened. We got free trade and not not basic income. <laughs> so we, we've always needed some means to help people in transition. We've needed some way that um, is better than the current social assistance system that requires you to lose everything before you can qualify. You imagine if, if the government did that during the pandemic. All right. Yeah, we know you're all going to be unemployed, but you better spend your own money and sell your house before you get any help. I mean, that, that's just crazy. It's, it's just it's just cruel. So suddenly the money was there when middle-class voters' jobs were, were on the line, but it's, somehow it's not there for people in poverty. And that's just not right. And um, so, but there's also an urgency here, even more so than the existential urgency or injustice of, of poverty is that um, uh, automation is fundamentally changing the job market. And that's my background as a software developer. So what we're seeing is multiple decades of the share of income going to work, going to people who work decreasing while the share of income going to capital, so people who own things, who own the machines, increasing. So the economy today and that young people are being um, entering the workforce is not the economy of, uh, of you know, the 70s and 80s, where a single income could raise a family and afford a vacation every year and, and afford a home. So it, life is literally getting harder for people while inequality is rising. Uh, and what we're seeing is, is something called a, a job polarization. Uh, so we're seeing middle income jobs go, disappear, uh, mainly due to software automation, and we're seeing growth in low income jobs and growth in high income jobs. But, but that means that more people are growing in low income jobs. So I think, I think a good economy is one where the, the size of the of more people are exiting low income work than entering it. So I think where we're going towards this is very dangerous, frankly, it's socially dangerous, to, um, you know, to, to have a, a environment where there's no middle class because we all know you know what tends to drive drive politics it's those who can afford afford it so it's not good for democracy it's not good for for solidarity so i think it's urgent because um uh yeah this 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 new phase of technological development we're we're going into will move way faster than any previous uh era that we've seen and i do think we'll have um I don't think we're going to have mass unemployment. I think we're going to have mass underemployment, and we already have mass underemployment. Canada is the number one country in the world for educated people, university degrees who are in poverty, and that's because of often the automation we already have. So that's anyway, that's that's why now. And I decided to do something about it. So I'm spending the the proceeds of my business to uh, fund U UBI Works, which which promotes basic income in Canada and engages Canadians to do um, activism and all kinds of, uh, of things that keep it, keep it top of mind. Uh, can I just yeah. get us to unmute for one second and just go, woo, uh, to Floyd. Okay, one, two, three, woo. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the reason I want to do that, Floyd. Can I have I was listening to a concert and uh, a online concert and the musician said, I miss my audience. And if you were at a liberal convention or you were at uh, a liberal nomination party, we would have done that after you said those words because we would have socially agreed that we need to do better 
so that by the people who who risk being left behind and what a gift that you've shared with us uh by investing the proceeds of your business uh to to make uh that potentially a reality uh, one question that I have is uh, there's lots of talk these days from uh, from whether it's levels of government, but especially in the provincial and federal governments, as we've talked about immunizations or we've talked about COVID spread, about the data. What does the data tell us? What does the data tell us? And you've just told us a really empathic and very true social uh, construct to why we ought to and, and the risks of if we don't. But what does the data tell us about actually what ought to happen and did in fact happen in the early pilots in the 60s? Uh, what does the data tell us and what research has your group done to tell us maybe is or is there not two sides to this? What would the data tell us about things on the other side if we really want to be open about the, the risks, constraints and the amazingness that we might see? Okay, um, so those of you who are advocates in the audience, these are good talking points you can use, and those who are skeptics, I hope uh, I make a dent. <laughs> so uh, there's been already um, many pilots in the last 50 years, and over 105,000 people have been in base income pilots where there was no reduction, statistical reduction in work. Um, the, statistically, in the pilots that happened in the 70s, the only constituencies that had a slight reduction in work were high school students who stayed in school longer uh, and mothers who, who stayed longer on mat leave, which arguably are good for society. Some of the pilots in the US also saw an increase in divorce rate because women were leaving abusive situations, uh, which is uh, very important to me because I grew up in a house with domestic violence. If my mom had a basic income, things would have been very different. And that, that's very important. Um, we saw a 42% reduction in crime in, in some pilots. Uh, in, in cases of extreme poverty, we actually saw work increase because people who could afford the tools of their own emancipation, afford to, to buy what they need to, to be able to get to work, to be able to present well in an interview or to start their own business. Um, these are things that we've seen an increase in small business. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw, um, I think I, I saw a survey that I think one in 10 people took a, started a new course, some online course trying to retrain um and we also saw an increase in wages actually one of the things I, i'm most fascinated about is how base kinka would increase wages for, for working people uh during the 70s pilot in manitoba uh median wages went up six and a half percent you might think well why why did median wages go up they didn't receive the base income well when, when people in low income can negotiate better pay uh, or retrain and get better work then everyone's pay goes up and, and we saw that during the pandemic, we saw um, wages in labor and hospitality increase uh, and, and companies having to compete and offer more benefits for those jobs, which typically are the lowest pay. And that would be great, right? So um, that's, that's a good way to have market forces drive wages to go up just by people having the freedom and power to, to do better for themselves. I love um, that. We, and uh, one thing I you reminded me of, I talk about basic income a lot. You know this. Sometimes I talk really quickly to you when I call you and want to talk about important issues uh, about it. Uh, but I also was having a conversation with my sister uh, about basic income. And she was asking that very thing, like, how do people in the middle do better? Uh, and my sister is a scientist uh, and she works for a fertility company. And what their company does is their company streamlines what I understand. This is my non-scientific explanation to any scientists in the crowd or anyone working in fertility medicine. Uh, this is a disclaimer. This is not advice. Uh, so my sister would uh, would has a, has a process within their company that tells you which of the three most common fertility issues that you, women might face uh, would streamline them into one of those three groups. And why does that matter? Well, if you can find out sooner uh, what your actual specific issue is, you don't spend very vital childbearing years uh, going down the alternative paths. And so I said to her, Alyssa, you know, people spend money on that right now. That's a private part of our, what ought to be, a, you know, a growing public healthcare system. Uh, and only people who can afford your medication or your drug can actually gain entry into that system. And then of course the tens, uh, uh, the, the many thousands of dollars that it costs to, to go down the further path. 
when people have more wealth, all people have more wealth, poor people, people living in deep poverty, they are infertile too. And they want to have children too. And they actually, so do people in low income and so do people in, in, uh, in low to medium income, but they just can't afford the fertility pathway. Your company will thrive in a basic income environment. And so, you know, I couldn't agree more that when we, we can talk about that in many different, different ways, uh, the, the businesses that might not thrive are those that have been built around a cottage industry of poverty. And I think we might ask ourselves if we are okay with that. Uh, so I see some questions in the chat and some comments. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Greg, to, to, uh, to ask any questions. You've got a Floyd while we have, uh, have uh, him here. Uh, and then uh, also consider the question in the chat. Yeah, uh, thanks Rochelle and, and Floyd. I think the thing that really resonated with me about what you said was just that the Ford government's decision to cancel the pilot just made you angry and made you think about ways to get involved. And that's exactly how it felt to me. I'm not a basic income expert. I'm not somebody who was you know, an advocate for this kind of program before, but I'm somebody who cares about good government policy. And for them to cancel the program after they had promised that they would not, just because they were afraid of seeing the data, just for some reason, that cut above all the other cuts that have affected so many people in Ontario just affected me personally. It was like, what? Well, how are these people in government if they don't at least want to see the data that could potentially help millions and millions of people in Ontario? And to me, that was the most frustrating thing. And that really was the genesis of me running for office was that I think just government um, that, I mean, I want to use a stronger word, but mistake by this government um, in canceling the pilot and not wanting to get that incredibly valuable data. So of course, I'm so grateful to Floyd for your advocacy. And Rochelle, I'm so grateful that you've also taken up this issue and championed it like I have. I mean, my entire nomination campaign was built around support for basic income. Uh, and I'm so excited that although we don't have a platform yet, that this is such an important issue that we have already promised that we will be bringing back uh, the basic income pilot. So that's amazing. Um, before we get to questions, I just do want to take a couple minutes because I know that Dana's in the audience um, here. And uh, Dana actually participated from Kortha Lakes in the pilot. Um, and I'm wondering, Dana, would you mind talking just for a couple minutes about your experience as a participant and, and what the, the pilot meant to you? You'll probably have to unmute yourself as well, I, I warn you. Hi, thank you everyone and hi. I'm so glad for all the interest here, that's for sure. I uh, definitely follow Floyd quite heavily and uh, I don't know where I'd be without advocates like Floyd. Um, the support is invaluable. So I was a recipient of the basic income. I live in Lindsay, Ontario. So this was the only what they called saturation site. So they could base um, our experience against the rest of Lindsay. I was on ODSP, couldn't go back to college to get, um, I wanted to get my social work degree. And to do so, I would have to come up with, that I wouldn't be able to go for grants or loans, cost of living, which would have meant I wouldn't have been able to get my prescriptions. They're costly. I live under $9,000 a month. So when the basic income pilot come along, here's an opportunity to go to school, have my prescriptions covered and not worry about putting healthy food on my plate and to be able to have some family time, which is, as we all know, is invaluable to be able to break bread with somebody instead of feeling like you're always taking and being a burden or on uh, somebody else's income that's struggling right along with yourself. I'm also one of the litigants or plaintiffs in the canceled um, basic income. I convinced a lot of people, this is a brilliant program. Like Greg said, I needed that data. I was looking for the data. I want to change the narrative of low income, that, that stigma, 
I really feel strongly that that would have broke it that open. And I think he wanted to bury it. That's my opinion. Um, not going to. We have shown, I think Lindsay sh shown in like not even 30 days of the canceled um, program when the last check went out in Lindsay, they lost 10% of economy in less than 30 days in Lindsay. That says a lot there, right there too. We were investing in local economy. We can invest and we're, and we're dealing locally and investing that way. So you feel like, you feel like you're a participant. You really feel like you're part of, you're not, you're not below, you're not. It was a very humbling experience to be perfectly honest with you. I feel that it's um, something that I will keep fighting for until one of two things happen. I can't breathe or it becomes a fact. That's it. I, I think a face needs to come on to people with poverty. I needed to, I, I, I championed for a lot of people to get involved in the pilot. And it was hard to see the carpet ripped right out from underneath the 4,000 of us, literally yanked out from one of us. And how we heard about this cancellation was Facebook and the news, which was insulting. It was insulting. We had to give up a lot of our personal information. We went in as a informed consent is how it was laid out to us and letting us know what we were willing to risk to receive this. So we gave our personal information to be part of a human basic income study. So the treatment from the government was horrific. It was horrific. I'm really happy to see the advocates. I can't tell you how much I'm grateful to you. It's emotional to see it because it gives me courage to keep going forward. Can't do it without the advocates and the lawyers and the people that keep fighting for this. I, uh, I'm open to any questions anybody has. I'm not shy about answering that stuff. So, but yeah, my, my desire to go back to school was squashed. And as a result of being on ODSP, I'm considered unemployable, but I'm still teachable. I really wanted my social work degree. Unless it comes back, I can't look at doing that again. So if it comes back, I'm off to school, Myth. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you to anybody. Any questions you have, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Dana, for sharing your personal story and taking some of your time tonight um, to share that with us. I mean, it means so much. And I think that, yeah, I, I just, my heart goes out to you. And, and when you talk about how the, you know, the rug was pulled out from under the, the 4,000 participants in the program, again, that, that's just, that's the thing that bothers me. I mean, we can, and governments will get elected and they will decide things based on their own politics. And that is their right. And that's the democratic system that we live in. Um, but to break promises of electors and also to just um, do such a disservice to the participants who, like you said, uh, agreed to share their personal information and share their stories in order to build on that data, I think was incredibly frustrating for me to listen to. Um, so Floyd, I wanna get to you before, I, cause I know you have to go very soon. So there's two interesting questions in the chat. The first is about uh, corporations and what responsibility you think corporations play in this versus governments. And then what impact uh, you think a, a basic income could have on inflation. So if you could just reflect on those before you go, that'd be amazing. Um, sure. Well, I mean, I think corporations can certainly pay their fair share. Uh, UBI Works has published a uh, how to pay article uh, last week that shows that that uh, we can have a basic income uh, as a starter, similar to the Ontario pilot, that would not cost uh, the vast majority of Canadians, probably wouldn't cost 97% of Canadians, and would avoid um, uh, ideological uh, tax reforms that, that might split the vote. So the tax would fall primarily on um, contributions from the finance sector, uh, reduce subsidies for large corporations and, and some subsidies that are used by the wealthiest Canadians. 
so it, it would attempt to 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 bridge that capital labor divide. Um, so there is certainly a way that companies can can pay their fair share, and um, and on the inflation argument, so it, inflation is primarily driven by supply and demand. Um, sometimes driven by by printing money, as we're all very familiar with in the headlines these days. Uh, no one is promote, suggesting a basic income from printed money. Um, so I, I don't think that would increase the money supply or have that impact. And if you think about the, the things that, that uh, people in poverty or lower income people buy, those things are not supply constrained. So there's really no reason to think that increased spending at a grocery store as opposed to a food bank uh, would cause inflation. Now, housing inflation is a problem already, regardless of of low-income people having a few extra bucks, uh, so I don't think that's that's really a, an issue. Um, and we already have uh, rent rent control and other controls like that that can can help with that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, um, Floyd. And I think um, your your point is definitely well taken. I mean, and the thing that also resonates for me from the studies that I've read is just you know how it helps. Um, local economies grow, actually. And Dana touched mm -hmm. on this and how important it was in Lindsay for the Lindsay economy, uh, because folks who are very under-resourced will spend the money that they get. And that is so valuable for local businesses and, and grocery shops and local stores, um, because people are much less likely to, you know, put it and invest it in some stock portfolio and much more likely to spend it on their basic needs, uh, which is going to um, be so great, so great for the economy. as oh, well. And, and that's been quantified now. So on, uh, on our website, uh, we have a, um, uh, we, we commissioned the Canadian Center of Economics Analysis to look at what impact would basic, basic income have on the economy. Uh, and they, they found that uh, a basic income, even a guaranteed basic income, what it would in the long term create 600,000 jobs. Uh, in the, even in the midterm, would create 300,000 300, jobs uh, and add $80 billion to GDP um, because it is a more efficient allocation of capital, frankly. Uh, if everyone can participate fully in the economy, uh, you know, more spending is happening from the bottom up and that induces job hiring because you know, we need to keep up with the demand. Uh, so that, that is a very exciting finding. And, um, and sh actually, one of the findings also is that a basic income would grow the economy by more than it costs. So, so if another reason to promote it, <laughs> because these days, everything has to be promoted from growing the economy. Um, so I, I really hope the, um, uh, that, you know, we have a liberal win because, and that the, the pilot happens quick. Because I think I think the reason why Doug Ford canceled the pilot is because by now there'd be so much good news out in the press every day about how well the pilot works. I don't think they could have conceivably decided to suddenly run on it themselves in the next election. So they'd be effectively been allowing the base building for another party, right? So that's they couldn't allow that. So I think it's entirely politically motivated. So so um, another question was why do we do another pilot? Well, that's unfortunate, and I, I agree we don't need another pilot, but. Uh, 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 yeah, unfortunately, that is the current policy of the, uh, on the liberal platform. Um, I, in my opinion, at this point, another pilot is just a marketing tool. So if, if that has to happen, I hope it opens a short one so the results come quickly and we can move on and actually implement it. Because um, we, we, within a few years, there'll be not only another, maybe Ontario pilot, if, if liberals win, there'll be tons of pilots from America that would have completed. So there'll be pilots everywhere. There'll be, we'll be saturated with pilots. So it'll be time to take action. I think that's also a really good point, Floyd. And I think um, on the politics of it, you know, I know that Senator Hugh Siegel, who's quite a conservative person, is one of the biggest supporters of basic income. Um, this isn't a left-right issue. It's a, it's a fundamental human rights and taking care of people in our society and trying to build a society that is um, prepared for the, for, the, for the 21st century more than anything else. Um, and um, yeah, I, I just, I completely understand your point about us not even needing a pilot that we should get started. Um, I am very sympathetic to that argument. Um, but I think that just because the Ford government robbed us of the data that we should have had here in Ontario, I think it is um, the duty for us um, as a party to get that data back, um, to honor the work that Dana did and the, all of the incredible sacrifices that folks who worked on this will do. And also it is up to us as the Ontario Liberal Party to be advocating for basic income. And when we have that data from Ontario in our hands, uh, you can bet that Rochelle and I are going to be really, really committed um, to making sure that this becomes a reality as quickly as possible. 
Yeah, I see a couple of questions and I want to get to them uh, right away. Uh, one of the things that I, I often think about is some of the biggest failures of government that I have been witness to uh, have been the policy decisions or the steps that haven't thought through and then, and then, and then, and then, and put a few parameters around those which have uh, a challenge or will have uh, some sort of uh, difficulty. Uh, and, and so I don't wanna minimize the, com the complexity issue because it is real and, and it is one that, that maybe we you know, do actually require uh, some runway or a pilot to consider. For example, a good farming friend of mine, uh, and I'm not sure if there's any farmers on the call, but a good farming friend of mine uh, couldn't employ uh, anyone uh, during the pandemic and their immediate response felt, they felt and they experienced that this was because of CERB. Because of CERB, I can't you know, employ someone. And if we actually want to do a root cause analysis, which we won't do on tonight's call, don't worry. Uh, but if we wanted to dig down on the root cause analysis of why my friend couldn't afford folks to drive their, their vehicles for their cash crops and the actual impact on this person was they were working 24 hours a day. We also don't agree that that's a good outcome. And we don't want to apply a simple solution to that, say, well, the farmer should just pay more. Well, the farmers price for their crops have such a minimal margin that they actually can't in this current context without significant losses like remortgaging their house. And so we have to just consider lots of things and I don't wanna overcomplicate it, but I think a pilot allows us to be thoughtful about all of the and thens uh, or if, at least a good portion of them so that we have a responsible policy all the way through. Uh, John Boyko, uh, you have a question. I do, it's a, it's a two-parter. One, I, I hear the talk about a basic income. Is this the same as a universal guaranteed basic income um, that would apply to everyone, universal? Um, the second part, if a universal basic income or basic income is implemented, does it replace all other social income supports, including boutique tax cuts? Okay. Rochelle, do you want to take this or I can too as well? Um, I will get actually just, I see Floyd and he's overstayed by a minute, but before Floyd, are you going to jump off or do you want to take a crack at any part of John's, uh, John's question? Uh, I can if answer not, this question and, and I fortunately okay. need to go. Um, <laughs> that's actually one of my favorite questions. There, there are many different basic income schemes. There's many different approaches to it, many different ways to pay for it. Um, a universal basic income means everyone gets the same amount. Um, and that would have a, a huge cost and, and a guaranteed basic income is where it goes mainly to people in need and has a, a lower cost. Now you can play accounting tricks and say, yeah, well, you can give everyone the same amount and then tax it back later, but that involves a, a, a pretty eye popping, um, income tax rate that I don't think is politically feasible. So the historical roots of a universal basic income is from ownership, co-owning something together like building a sovereign wealth fund that can pay everyone a dividend. Um, uh, you know, Andrew Yang campaigned on effectively imagining that the GST is a, a toll in the economy. So we all own the economy. So we should all get the same amount. Uh, but that's not necessarily an anti-poverty solution. So with the guaranteed basic income, you can increase the benefit amount for a, um, uh, a, a, lower, lower ticket, a lower tax increase, frankly, which is probably more politically feasible. So most politicians who talk about basic income, even if they use the word UBI, they really mean a guaranteed basic income, uh, which is the one that I, I posted a link earlier is we showed a way to pay for it. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I think might, might win in, in the election. So whether what pr programs it replaces, uh, it, generally people are discussing it to fill in the gaps in the system. So it would not, not, not include or overlap with, with, um, uh, uh, with o OAS, GIS, or anything that affects seniors, it would be for people from 18 to 64, but it could also be for all, all ages as, as well. And uh, it would only probably replace programs that have a lower benefit amount than the basic income. So in, in my ideal outcome, you would have a, a national basic income, and then all the other programs would be built on top of it uh, as a top-up. 
uh, which would actually mean the majority of people on programs would no longer need to be on programs because they'd be better off with the basic income. But few of those who, who do need to be on certain assistance programs, like people with disabilities, for whom a basic income is not enough, would continue to get support. So, so very importantly, no one who promotes basic income in Canada is suggesting removing important social services. Like it doesn't mean we're going to lose jobs for social workers. It just means that the cash part of support that people need uh, could come from one program that has less conditions or is unconditional uh, than the current um, uh, hula hoops people have to jump through to, to get the help that they need. Um, and also on tax credits, uh, the PBO did show a way to pay for basic income that comes only from eliminating tax credits. So it would be a simplification of the tax system. But my, my concern with that one is that it still effectively raises income taxes on everybody, including low-income Canadians. Uh, so, so tax credits can only get you so far, uh, but it's certainly a way to do that as well, to, to fund a basic income. Yeah. And John, you would have... You, oh, you go ahead, Rachel. I was just going to thank Floyd before uh, you, I don't, I've now made you four minutes late, uh, now five, um, but <laughs> okay. uh, Floyd, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am Thanks, everyone. To you, uh, my friend, and I uh, am also incredibly grateful that you shared your wisdom uh, and knowledge so generously with us tonight. Thank you. Make sure to vote for Greg and Rochelle and uh, hope the, we have a, a liberal win and we have a pilot coming quickly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, we'll Floyd. see you later. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye, friend. Yeah. Um, and and just, yeah. Uh, you've got your hand up there. Sorry, Greg. Oh, so I'm just going to, I just want to say something about John's question that I think is really important. So John, you would have seen that the title of this event, we kept it to basic income because we're not trying to privilege one form of basic income or the other. Uh, Floyd mentioned some of the benefits and costs of some of the different models. But again, I think this is why, uh, it's another reason why a pilot would be so helpful because we could try all the different kinds of basic income and then be able to tailor our program to the approach that fits the best. And I know, I mean, it is also our job, as I've said before, that we need, Rochelle and I need to be advocates for this once we get elected. We need to convince not just our supporters, but indeed the entire province of Ontario, why this is a good idea, why it will actually save money, contribute to growth and be the right thing to do. And depending on how we structure the program is gonna matter a lot to how we're gonna be able to, to convince Ontarians that is the right policy. And that's why I'm really, looking forward to us exploring not just one specific model of basic income, but a few different ones so that we can get it right. Yeah, I couldn't say it um, better, uh, Greg, that there are some real experiences like the, the, the feed farmer who, who, can't, uh, who can't run his trucks. And so, you know, there, we need to consider all of the experiences with policy uh, responses that make a lot of good sense for Ontarians. Uh, and uh, for for middle income and for uh, for others as well, uh, we don't want a, a program that people uh, don't understand. Uh, and I also think, you know, I said I think one of the biggest challenges is when we don't think about the end thens. I think it's also when we really struggle with communications. And Greg's pointing to a really great uh, point that. This is critical policy, and there are so many supporters in the chat, and I couldn't agree more. Like, this is just, this is right. How can we live with this? Uh, and, and on the other side of our outrage, we've also seen really divisive politics of late. And we have a leader, and you know, I can speak on behalf of Greg and I, who are committed not to polarizing politics but to finding common ground and to amplifying good ideas and to having the conversations with all Ontarians, yes, about good policy and how it affects all of us. And so I think that, uh, that that's a really important question in terms of the models and thinking that through. Okay, Janet, it's your turn, your, your hand is- Thanks up. for being patient with us, Janet. Um, I was, uh, I was on the, um, the affordable housing board for, uh, I guess, a total of probably close to six years. But I think if I learned anything, it's that uh, poverty is a circle. It's not any one particular thing, but it starts with, it starts with housing. And housing starts with a sustainable income. Because if you can give a sustainable 
guaranteed income, it doesn't matter if it happens to be a whole lot, but as long as people can count on it, you're going to keep the kids in school. You're going to cut down drastically on trips to the, uh, to the ER. Uh, the whole of the, the family separation uh, goes away, way down. So the benefits to the society as a whole is pays off in spades if we can get that guaranteed income so that people can get out there, work at the jobs that they can find, get topped up enough that they can, that they can main, uh, maintain a respectable uh, part of society. So the reason that I have become really involved in this campaign is because of that. Uh, I've had enough experience to, to know exactly what happens when it fails. Uh, the problems with affordable housing in these is there's, there's no space. The, the waiting list is anywhere from five to 10 years. Well, if somebody who doesn't have enough money to put food on the table or to rent a basic uh, basement apartment, to say to them, well, in five or 10 years, we can probably put you in somewhere. That, that is not, that's not the way that a society with the financial um, uh, backing that this country has should, it, should accept. So the guaranteed wage will allow people to get where they are, stay there. They don't have to try to get into a facility somewhere, move out of their neighborhood. So the circle starts there. And uh, hats off to the people who advocate for it. Um, if you think about it, it's not a hard sell. Yeah, yeah I no. couldn't agree more. Uh, Janet, absolutely. I see other people giving you a thumbs up and acknowledging housing is health. Uh, and uh, I saw a duffier comments uh, in the chat as, as well. Uh, for those who don't know, or I guess Greg, you said in, in the introduction, uh, I'm the CEO at the Guelph Community Health Center. Uh, and community health centers uh, and uh, other community governed uh, uh, family medicine practices or, or primary health care across the province. Uh, what community governed means is that uh, your, your board members reflect uh, the diversity of the communities uh, that, that you serve. Uh, and so uh, community uh, health centers and, and across the province of Ontario recognize that poverty impacts health, homelessness impacts your health. And the, da the data is so crystal clear that many social determinants uh, impact health where income is, I loved how you framed it, uh, Janet, like the, the really the core, like the true complicating social determinant of health is deep poverty, where you, uh, you become homeless from poverty and can't recover back into housing without income. Uh, and, uh, and if we want to talk about uh, gender or if we talk about uh, about ethnicity, each of those becomes intersectional or more complicated uh, with poverty. And yeah. so uh, we really know that we can impact health uh, through, uh, through addressing poverty. In fact, we can transform health. And so I saw a question around how much can be saved and I think we're thinking really maybe just in the income area, all of the administration of the current system. Yes, those are their savings there. But if we actually address poverty, the savings in healthcare, in child welfare, in corrections, poverty begets many complicated factors in people's lives and in fact is the core social determinant of health. Uh, Colleen, you had your hand up. Did you wanna ask something or say something? You're on, there you go. I would like, I would like to actually say something. I'm client of the Guelph Community Health Center. I'm also on the, on the client advisory committee on co-chair. Um, so I meet a lot of people that are like myself that are unable to work because of physical disabilities and the government gives us basically a thousand dollars a month to live on 
and um, my name's been on housing since 2010. I do have subsidized housing, but it's still hard to live on a thousand a month. And there's a lot of people out there that are having that. And good old Buddy Ford took away our 1% increase. And just so you know, the building I live in, they are increasing the rent by 4.2% because of capital expenses. And then the government's going to raise it 1.2%. I'm not sure where I'm going to end up. And there'll be a lot of other people in that. That's, I, I just want people to hear it from the other side, if that's okay. Thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Uh, so your your uh, connection was a little choppy at the beginning. So just the beginning part, I'll repeat, which is uh, Colleen said that she is a client of the Community Health Centre and also on our client advisory uh, committee, which is where clients participate to help design uh, health solutions uh, that work for them, that help to reduce some of the barriers that exist. Uh, but I was actually thinking before I joined this call this evening about the vision statements, you know, if we are wildly successful, what will happen of so many of the different organizations and businesses in our community. And our mission and vision statement at the health center, community health center is a community without barriers to health and well-being. A community without barriers to health and well-being. And uh, I see Duff Sprague, who was the former CEO of the, the uh, Fort Hope Community Health Center. Uh, and, and I'm sure you had something similar, Duff, where we want to eliminate barriers to good health. However, income will always be an interrupter of that. No, Michelle, if I can make a comment, you know, I hold you in the highest esteem and certainly my time at Community Health Center meant a lot to me. But I spent 15 or 18 years, I can't remember, in various ministries. And one of the things, you know, I encourage you is so many governments come into office looking for the quick win. Every day it's the quick win. What's the headline? What can we do? And, and this is the long game. The, the results, the savings at emergency departments and, you know, the social services, they're down the road. They're not within that first term. And, uh, and I just spent too much time in the ministry, you know, hearing these quick wins and they're not going to see it out to the end. Um, you know, and that's what uh, I really feel this requires is a commitment to the long game. I couldn't agree more, uh, Duff. I say that a lot in the beginning. <laughs> I agree with you guys a lot. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I think about with that is one of the first questions I asked uh, on a walking meeting with one of my first you know, uh, uh, people I was talking to about how do you make that, that staying change when election cycles are four years. However, we know that, that yes, we will see some economic growth. Uh, and, and, and Dana this evening told us, you know, about the, the growth in the economy in Lindsay uh, and the impact when it was cut. So there will be some immediate uh, immediate benefits. And of course, there will be human immediate benefits. But the measurable cost savings, which is often what we want uh, to definitely make sure are going to be there, has to be built on some foundations of trust. It has to be built on foundations of trust. Authentic, meaningful, open government conversations where we say we are almost certain of the impact this program will have and we need you to stay with us while we demonstrate that. Because yeah, that too often we talk with certainty 
And it becomes a, will it or won't it? I don't know if I trust them. Let's not elect them. And we can't give that option. It has to be built on, uh, on, on a greater level of trust. And then of course, outcome measurement, continuous quality improvement and outcome measurement, pivoting when we learn new things and changing when we fail. And we will, there will be parts of any basic income pilot or long-term implementation where we will struggle and we will be seen by some that we uh, will fail. But I do think that there is a greater opportunity for us to transform across the entire province the way that we handle health and well being services in our community. And so I think it's worth it. Deb, I just want to comment really briefly on what you said, Duff, because I think that's super important as well. You know, I have built my career in the public service, I have been that government official that has. Um, been, you know, told to implement certain government programs. And I know how to get things done in government. And I know the strategies to make things work. And there are going to be bureaucrats and public servants in the Ontario government that are not going to appreciate me getting elected uh, to represent the people of Peterborough Kawartha because I will fight doggedly for the programs that we care about. And I will make sure that they are implemented and are not pushed down the road. Uh, Cause I know the systems and I know the incentives that are built into them, the caution, the status quo. And we're really looking at something that could be absolutely transformative here as Rochelle you know, and Floyd have said. And so that means that we're going to need to put in the work and talk to people and convince not just Ontarians, but also convince those whose job it will be to implement this program. Uh, and I can tell you right now that Rochelle and I are absolutely eager to do that work. Um, and the thing that also resonates with me on this program, you know, we held uh, early in my nomination, I want to say a year ago, we held um, a little discussion with folks at the Mount Community Centre in Peterborough, which is just an amazing place that has um, uh, subsidized housing options for folks. And almost everybody who lives there is on some form of uh, fixed income, whether it be ODSP or Ontario Works or some other program. And one of the residents was talking about how she um, did not apply for a program she was eligible for, uh, for about six months time that would have paid her $100 a month. And $100 a month doesn't seem like a lot of money to folks like me who are privileged, who have a salary. Uh, but to her, that was 20 meals that she had to skip every single month because she did not get that $100. And it's because she was not a informed that she was eligible for it by her social worker and B because the paperwork was so onerous. And I think this is something that we haven't yet touched upon today is how much work it is to be poor and how much paperwork and oversight and, and just stress there is involved in being under-resourced. Um, and that's just another reason why I'm so motivated to, to put this kind of program into place, so. Um, I saw I saw that Janet had her um, hand up again, but I, I want to just make sure, Janet, it, with your indulgence, that other folks who haven't had a chance to speak, if they uh, would like to put their hands up. I think Jennifer Turner had her hand up there very briefly, but then maybe put it down again. I'm not really sure, um, but uh, I'm happy to open it up to anybody else who'd like did, to speak. I did have my hand up, Greg. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Um, so, I, I, of course, I feel passionately about this topic. Um, you know, Canada and Ontario has such abundance and, and the fact that we allow people to live in poverty is abhorrent and it, it has to end. And, and, you know, I care about so many issues, but I'm working very hard on this campaign because I know that um, Greg shares the passionate belief with me that we need to create a safety net to prevent people from living in poverty. I have a developmentally delayed daughter and, you know, sometimes when life happens, you, you notice things that you wouldn't normally notice. And I think um, to a large extent, a lot of people are absolutely unaware of, of people living in poverty. They're, and I know I've, I've read a lot about it. And I think that people living in poverty feel invisible and, and left behind. And that has to be such an incredibly lonely thing. And we, we, we have to inform people. And 
uh, we have to elect people like Greg and Rochelle who care about these things. And I, I know um, that the foundation of this campaign is protecting our most vulnerable. And the, the, uh, I, I can't imagine a more transformational policy that we can create. Um, as you know, Duff mentioned, it can't be just short term to get the win. It has to be a long term uh, policy that is solid in our society. Um, because this is not going away and to allow people to live on $1,100 a month um, breaks my heart. You know, you're grocery shopping and you think there are people in this grocery store right now who have to think about every single item that they put in their cart. And uh, I know you, all of you share this, uh, this feeling with me, but we just have to get the word out and we have to make sure that um, we elect good people. And, you know, Greg and Michelle are examples of people who have the skills and knowledge to be, to be good leaders. And, and Greg has, you know, brought such a great number of diverse stakeholders to tables. Um, but elected officials need to have an empathetic heart, even though they haven't experienced the, these things or walked this walk they can imagine and and they have the empathy to understand that this is the absolute time for this to happen and and no longer will we look away it has to happen now and so i i you know thank you everyone for being here and caring and and working hard on elections because it is going to make a difference and good government and good people in government do make a difference and and this is the time and darn it we're going to make basic income happen. Thank you. Love it, yeah. Jennifer. That's incredible. Uh, I, uh, mm. I see a comment uh, in the chat that said, being poor is exhausting. Being poor is exhausting. <clears throat> and there was periods in my growing up that I did live in in deep poverty. Uh, my mom was a single mom and she went back to teacher's college when I was in grade four. Uh, and I spoke actually once at a food uh, insecurity talk. And I was, my, the picture behind me was a picture of spaghetti as I talked. And I, I talked about how we had spaghetti uh, every day that year. And I asked my mom before I talked if she was okay with me saying that. Uh, and she said, well, that's not really fair. We had fish and chips on some nights uh, throughout that year. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't love pasta. There's a lot of things I do love, but I don't love pasta. I actually can't stand pasta because of, uh, because of that experience. Uh, and it were certainly pales in comparison to some of the entrenched and chronic homelessness and poverty uh, that folks are enduring now. Uh, but I couldn't agree more that it's hard. It was exhausting. Mm. Saving money to, to, to go to a laundromat, to wash clothes and garbage bags. Like it's exhausting. Uh, and so I, I my uh, deep thanks to, to Dana for sharing uh, your experience of what it could mean uh, to relieve that, uh, that exhaustion uh, and to give some, uh, some dignity uh, around, uh, around being able to participate in your community. And that was just something that really resonated with me, uh, Dana. And I wondered if you could say something else about that or had anything more to add about what it felt like to be seen and participating in your community with the basic income. Well, thank you, Rochelle, for that. You know, I have a, there's a particular story and it's actually not with me. It was with one of my neighbors and I didn't realize what I was seeing beforehand. So one of my neighbors, shortly after the pilot started, stopped me and he was beaming. He was beaming. He could have lit up Lindsay with his energy and so happy he was. And he lifted up his shirt to tell me he went and got a back brace for his back so he could go and volunteer for a restore. I didn't realize up until that point, he literally walked around. I'm sorry, it's emotional because I still remember it. He walked around with the world on his shoulders. He, he the weight of that. It's just profound to realize he stood up and he wanted to still give back. And 
we're not a drain on society. This, the basic income shows that we couldn't save people money for hospitals and these visits and our kids going to school and crime and leaving domestic abuse. There are so many things that are there. Um, I felt good to be able to not worry about when I went into the grocery store to go, um, I can't have this. And people looking over my shoulder knowing, oh, it's welfare day. Welfare day. They're all in the store now. Look at them buying their beer and popcorn. Sorry, I just got to say it. Right. You know, and then. It is so, and you have to watch every penny and put things back. And it's trying to do that subtotal in your mind to make sure you're kind of not letting somebody know beside you what's going on. Do you know, since this, especially with this pandemic lately, I haven't gone grocery shopping. I can't afford it. I've been living from a food bank. And that's the truth. The food banks are getting hit hard, hard. Um, I went to a food bank one time and was given, and you're only allowed so much food in a month. You cannot go back. That's your allotment. So I went in and I got pickled lemongrass. What am I supposed to, what is that? And then a can of palm hearts. And again, what's that either? But that's considered my food allowance for the month. And it's demeaning. I appreciate that the food banks are there, but they were only supposed to be a temporary thing. And now they become mainline. And it's not just poverty or needing them. Middle income is fastly sliding into my lane. I understand them and have a lot more compassion about you're a slip and fall away from that poverty line. You are a slip and fall away. And it's not because I'm lazy and it's not because of those other things that are said, those easy clapbacks, you know, that it's just too easy. It's like, come with the solution. I'm more than willing to listen, but I'm not willing to go and have a job that I have to work three jobs and still not get benefits to be able to look after my prescription needs. Um, yeah, it's, it's just the basic income gave me dignity. I could go to my farmer's market. It was so fun. I was buying homemade goat's milk soap, which is, I feels better for me, but I was in, I was going to my local people and buying and supporting my locals who've been always looking after me, whether they donate to a food bank or to a non-for-profit or what have you. I was a contributing member to my own community and to myself. So yeah, it's uh, the dignity was profound, profound. Thank you for the question, Rochelle. Yeah, Dana, we're, we're so lucky that you were willing to share your personal experiences. And I think it just, you know, it just completely reinforces the need for this policy. And um, I am looking forward. I mean, there are lots of things that we are going to need to do. And Rochelle knows this as well as I do. Um, there are housing issues and there are um, healthcare issues, education issues. We have a climate in crisis. There's an opioid crisis in Peterborough. Um, the day, the first day that I am elected, I am going to be asking for a meeting on basic income because it is the policy that I believe could be the most transformational for addressing all of those issues uh, that we spoke about. Um, and it's because Make of your sure advocacy. you invite Dana. me, Gregory. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, we have about, I would say, eight minutes left. I'll turn the floor over to, to Jackie first. I'm sorry, Janet. I'm just, I want to make sure that other folks get a chance to talk. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll I'll go back to you, Janet. Oh, I think you're, we can't hear you, Jackie. We could before. I have a new, okay. I'm trying to get a microphone, go. but I'm not used to it yet. I'm a Peterborough resident. I'm on ODSP. Um, I agree with lots of what's said, and I'm just thinking of my current situation. Um, I, I have a um, chronic illness, 
And right now I'm still worried about going out to the grocery store just to be safe. I want to be at home during the pandemic. I don't feel it's safe. I could get Instacart, but I can't afford Instacart. It would be safer, but it's more expensive. I have to go to the grocery store. I did find somebody on Twitter who sent me two N95 masks, which is good, but I think I'm using them too much because I don't think I can afford any masks. I don't know where to find them, if they're good, whatever. So I'm kind of like hoarding them and reusing them. I don't want to end up in the hospital. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to have to use more resources. So I do end up being isolated at, at home a lot more, but that's just one current um, incident that, you know, more income would definitely make a difference for me anyway, thanks. Yeah. Jackie, uh, you speak to an issue that we have grappled with at health centers across the province, which is personal protective equipment, masks uh, for staff was our first crisis. And then how do we support equity, uh, equitable access to, to masks and, and rapid antigen tests? Uh, for uh, our many community residents. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, we have been forced in our current situation, our current government to rely on charity, to rely on the donation of two masks via Twitter to be the way that our community's residents can go to the grocery store. And I think sometimes if we just changed simply the tone of what we say and slow it down and just ask, is that okay? Are we okay with that? And I had this moment, I do a I just got muted, is that a hint? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so it says the host muted you. Uh, I, I do a lot of thinking while I'm running. And I was running uh, the other morning and I thought I uh, was thinking about basic income because I just had a conversation with Floyd last week about this event. And I thought, I want to be part of, I want it to be in my lifetime that we look back to this social services system with apologies, with embarrassment, with the, I can't believe we let it go on that long, with the, I'm so glad I was part of something that stood for courage and conviction and stood for basic income for people because it's humane. The stories that are being shared in the chat uh, or that were shared by Dana or just shared uh, by Jackie. It's not how we treat people. It's not how I treat people and it's not how I'm okay with people in my community being treated. And so that's what Greg means when he says the first meeting we're gonna have is going to be on basic income is because we aren't okay with people in our community having to get N95s on Twitter yeah. in order to go to a grocery store where they're counting the pennies and keeping things wrapped in boxes to ensure that they have enough to eat for the week or the month. That's not the Ontario I want to, to grow old in. And it's not the Ontario that I want to live into. And so I once had a good friend challenge me create the world you want to live into, which is a bit of a spin on, on Gandhi. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it be the change you want to be. And so I'm really, really proud to stand for an election with uh, my friend Greg and, and the, uh, I think almost 100 candidates that have been nominated across this province on our way to 122. Uh, and uh, I really believe that we can live into the future we want uh, or create the future we want to live into. Uh, so Greg, I'm gonna pass it back to you to moderate uh, the last couple of questions. Yeah, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Janet. And I'm sorry, Sue, we've just run out of time. But Sue, you've been so prolific 
um, in the chat. And I just want uh, everybody to know that for all of these town halls that we host, we always save the chat uh, for everybody to keep all of everyone's comments. Um, so it's, um, yeah, yeah, we really, really appreciate the folks who've taken the mic, but also people who've been so great about sharing their experiences in the chat as well. Um, so Janet, I'll turn it over to you really quickly before we close. Okay, I think tonight, for the most part, you're speaking to the uh, to the choir, and that's that's good because it shows you the indication. But the people that I'm talking to are are saying, like restaurant tours, how are we going to afford this? Who's going to pay for this? And I guess my my question to you is, if you can get your hands on uh, the data that came out from that first part of the study, use that data because the the stories and everything else they're 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 very real and they're very personal, but for people who want to make a case against something, that doesn't touch them at all. We've got to give them the data that says this will save you money because this will save them money. And that's the one thing that the doubting Thomases are going to have a tough time uh, turning their back on. So the data's out there. Use it. <laughs> yeah, Janet, the 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 data that really resonates for me is that there was a basic income study that was done in Vancouver in 2020. And they gave folks who were homeless, who did not have addiction problems and did not have mental health issues. And they gave them $7,500 with no questions asked. All they asked is that they followed them and so that they could get the data. And they had a control group of people who were in the exact same situation who did not get this. And then they measured just simply the cost of social services that those folks used who got the payment and those who didn't get the payment. And those who got the payment used well less than $7,500 worth of food banks and emergency room visits and shelter costs and social services. And actually, I mean, the government didn't even pay for the study, but it saved the government more than $7,500 per participant. And that's not even talking about the increased economic impacts that, that we said, the well-being and confidence that people have when they know that they will have an income so they can get us safe place to live and stay. There, there are so many potential positive impacts, but I love where you're thinking and how you really, because it will be up to Rochelle and I and everyone on this call to talk about this issue as much as we can, because we are going to need to convince more people. We can't just speak to those who are already in support. We are going to need to A, win the election, and B, to implement this policy in a way that is actually going to be meaningful for Ontarians. Absolutely. Exactly. Thoughtful governance. Thoughtful governance, which is looking at all of the levers that we have available and listening to all sides of those who are impacted and designing with, uh, Colleen will be looking at me because she hears me say this, designing with, not for designing with mm. not for and so uh, that that means that the people who are the most impacted uh, have uh, have a say in how how things and the people who have negative impacts have say uh, they doesn't mean that their say will always be the answer but it does mean that they're included uh, and so I really, really thank you all for being here tonight uh, from across our province. Uh, and it's so, uh, so great to see you. And thank you for your support. Uh, Greg and I are privileged uh, and, and so proud to stand before you as your candidates. Uh, and we cannot wait uh, for June the 2nd, but more importantly, we can't wait for June the 3rd. Yeah, and, and the only thing that I will share as we close, um, Thank you, Rochelle, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, and in listening to you being so vulnerable and open and sharing your own personal story, the only thing I could really think about was how lucky we would have for you to be elected as the MPP for Guelph. We would be so lucky if you were our, the MPP. Um, and I would feel so lucky and privileged if I were able to call you my colleague. Um, so... It's That's going to be a uh, 
that's an amazing acknowledgement. Uh, and uh, thank you, Greg. And I could not uh, agree more. It's great when we meet friends in our work path. And it's great to see so many friends on tonight too from different paths in life. And Dana, a, a special acknowledgement again on behalf of our uh, two communities. Uh, for your voice, uh, for your commitment to this issue, uh, and for being such an incredible champion. I actually just got a text from uh, a Guelphite on the call from, uh, from Guelph, uh, Gary Roche, and he said, wow, Dana, uh, I learned so much from her. And so from, uh, from all of us, thank you uh, for sharing your voice, Colleen, as well, for speaking about your experiences of living uh, in this current system, Jackie. And to all of you, a really great evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night.